Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the FSN E-Commerce Ventures Limited Q3 FY24 Earnings Call, hosted by Morgan Stanley. This event is not for members of the press. If you are a member of the press, please disconnect and reach out separately. For more imp important disclosures, please see the Morgan Stanley Disclosure website at www.morganstanley.com forward slash research disclosures. Please note that this call and your questions will be recorded and may, in certain circumstances, be distributed to clients and or made publicly available. By participating in this event, you can send to such recording, distribution and publication. All participant lines will be in a listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. I'll now hand the conference over to Ms. Sheila Rathi with Morgan Stanley. Thank you and over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. This is Sheila Rathi from Morgan Stanley Research. Welcome to the FSN E-Commerce Ventures Limited Q3 F24 Earnings Call. From the management of NICA, we have Ms. Palguni Nair, Executive Chairperson, MD and CEO. Ms. Ranjit Nair, Executive Director and CEO of Beauty E-Commerce. Ms. Advaita Nair, Executive Director and Co-Founder, CEO of NICA Fashion. And Mr. P. Ganesh, Chief Financial Officer. Uh, before we start, we would like to point out that some of the statements uh, made in today's call may be forward-looking in nature, and a disclaimer, disclaimer to this effect has been included in the presentation. Kindly note that the call is meant for investors and analysts only. With that, over to you, Palguni, for your opening remarks. Thank you very much, Sheila. It's, it's a pleasure to be here amongst all of the investors. Um, and thank you for giving us this opportunity. Uh, I'll begin with the presentation. Uh, we'll begin with performance highlights. So I think uh, we saw that quarter three of financial year 24, NICA continues to drive profitable growth. Our gross merchandise value at 3,620 crores is about 29% year-on-year growth. Uh, the net sales value, and I'll talk the numbers in million, at 17,866 million is about 24% year-on-year growth. And revenue from operations at 17,888 million is about 22% year-on-year growth. Uh, on the gross profit basis, uh, our gross profit came out at 7,600 million, which is about 20% year-on-year growth. And the gross margins are at 42.5%, which is, I'll bet, about 86 basis lower on a year-on-year -year basis. There are more details on each of those in later numbers, and hence I won't elaborate on these here. On the EBITDA, sorry, I'll just talk about the EBITDA. On the EBITDA basis, our EBITDA came out at 988 million, a 26% year-on-year growth, and the EBITDA margins are at 5.5%, which is about 18 basis point improvement. And on the profit before tax basis, it's at about 265 million, almost 109% year on year growth with profit, profit PVT margin at 1.5%, which is a 62 basis point improvement on a year on year basis. With that, the PAT has come out at 175 million rupees, which is 106% year on year growth with a PAT margin at 1%, almost a 40 basis point improvement. Taking it forward, um, I think we are delivering growth across all our verticals, and we are happy about that. I think what we've done is we have given the year-on-year -year growth for the third quarter of the current financial year, but at the bottom, we've also given a two-year CAGR for each of the businesses so that you can con compare how the businesses are growing from a medium-term perspective. On the GMV basis, the beauty grew at about 25% on a year-on-year -year basis. It's a similar growth rate as a uh, two-year CAGR. On the fashion business, the GMV growth came out at about 40% year-on-year, with the fashion G GMV at 10,125 million, and this is about a 45% CAGR growth over a two-year period. If I look at the other businesses, which includes uh, mainly the uh, Nika Man as well as the EB2B business uh, platform, which is the most significant part of the business, what we call as a superstore by Nika. Uh, that other business has grown at about 39% on a GMV basis. 
Within that, the superstore business has grown 68% on a year-on-year basis, and the two-year CAGR is at about 122%. The GMV of these businesses now stands at 2,373 million, so it is becoming reasonably significant. Uh, on the NSV basis, the growth in beauty were lower at about 20%, and the NSV was at about 13,805 million. One of the reasons for divergence in the GMV and NSV growth in beauty particularly is that it was a difficult year for many of the beauty companies in the country. And as a result, the discounting that they are offering to the consumer has gone up. Many of you are aware about some of the rural growth and uh, growth in other channels being slower. And as a result, the discounting in beauty business has gone up a little bit more this year. And there's more on that that Anshit will take us through. On the fashion business, the NSV grew at 31% compared to the GMV of 40%. Similarly, slightly higher discounting. Uh, and in the others business, in fact, you can see that the NSV growth was at 88% against the uh, GMV growth of 68%, especially for Superstore. And for overall category, 67% NSV growth against 39%. This is particularly indicating some of the improvements that NICA did in terms of leakages that these businesses used to face. And with that kind of leakage improvement, we've been able to deliver higher NSV growth compared to GMB. NSV growth for other businesses also came out at 1,309 million. And a two-year CAGR on NSV growth has been as healthy as 221% year on year. Next. So like we talked about it uh, a couple of years ago that we were aiming for business diversification to serve the larger TAM. And that's exactly what NICA has been able to achieve. So if you look at a two-year period between quarter three of 22 to quarter three of 24, you can see that against the total net sales value of 17,866 million, now beauty contributes about 78%, with fashion contributing 15%, and other category contributing about 7%. Um, I think uh, you can see that all of the businesses are growing healthy in a similar manner, with, of course, some of the really nascent businesses outperforming in terms of growth. And this is resulting in fair amount of diversification and yet diversified growth. Each of the businesses are delivering growth. Uh, on the on the right hand side, from the opportunity perspective, we have always said that BPC's overall $31 billion market and it is broken into three components of online being about 10 billion, organized offline, which we call as modern trade, about 9 billion, and unorganized offline, which is about 12 billion opportunity. And Nika now plays pretty aggressively in each of the three segments. We dominate online beauty, but we also have a very significant presence in physical retail now. And similarly, we are building our presence through the superstore to cater to the GTMT segment. In fashion, we've always said that it's five times the size of the beauty market, and that's what excites, the, excites, us, excites us about the business. And we are addressing about $49 billion of that opportunity that exists in the on online segment currently. <clears throat> With that, I hand over to Anshit to talk about the beauty business. Yeah, thank you very much. So I will uh, quickly run through the slides. Uh, giving an update on the performance of the beauty.com, the beauty physical retail, as well as our private brands on the beauty side, uh, those various business segments. Um, so if you see the chart on the top left corner, you will notice that the GMV growth over the past two years for the BPC segment has been roughly 25%, uh, taking us to about 2,369 crores of GMV for the quarter ended uh, December 31st. In terms of the mix of business, our the loyalty and the stickiness of our existing customers continues to improve, and that reflects in an improvement in the mix of business coming from repeat versus repeat versus new buyers, now standing at 78% and 22% respectively. NSV growth came in at about 23% over a two-year CAGR and uh, ended the quarter at 1,380 crores of NSV for the BPC segment. Annual unique transacting customers stood at 11.1 million uh, versus 9.6 million the year before and a 21% CAGR over a two-year period. In terms of the number of orders that were serviced in the quarter, it was stood at 11.1 million orders uh, were serviced uh, in the quarter uh, ended December 31st. Next slide, please. So this is a very uh, interesting and unique innovative event 
which Nike hosted uh, for the first time this year. Uh, it was called Nike Land. Uh, it was India's biggest beauty festival. It is a one of a kind event in which over 80 global and local brands participated in a two day beauty festival. We had 15,000 plus customers who bought tickets to attend this event. Uh, and there were over 12 master classes that were hosted and 5,000 participants attending those master classes. Uh, these events were hosted by makeup artists and professional beauty experts from across the world, including Mario Deni Ivanovic, uh, as well as others listed on the page. Uh, there was significant attendance from celebrities as well, Bollywood celebrities, and over 800 plus influencers and KOLs. As a result, we managed to create over 5.5 billion impressions from this two-day event, and 5,000 pieces of content were created and disseminated across both online and offline channels. So this is uh, an event which we see as instrumental in the role which Nike plays in the ecosystem, which is that of category creators. Events such as these allows customers to access and to be educated on on beauty as a category, and these are the kind of events that will accelerate the expansion of the addressable market of beauty in India and help to take the per capita spend on beauty to higher levels than where they are today, which happen to be some of the lowest in the world. So please enjoy the video and um, in about five seconds, we can move on. Great, so moving on to the next slide. This was an important quarter for Nike Beauty, also from a premiumization perspective. Uh, as we have always stated, one of our strategic pillars of the business is to continue to premiumize the consumption of beauty in India. Uh, we believe that not only does India under-index in terms of per capita spend on beauty, but premium beauty as a percent of overall beauty is also highly under-indexed uh, uh, compared to other developing and developed economies. As India's GDP per capita increases, Uh, we are very optimistic that premium beauty and prestige brands will continue to gain more market share and drive uh, better uh, uh, unit economics for both brand and retailers alike. Uh, here on this slide, there are a couple of examples of some of the brands which were launched by Nike in Q3. As you can see, some of these names you might recognize, they are globally well-renowned brands. The first on the page is the brand Cerave. Cerave is a derma skincare brand that is owned by the L'Oreal Group, and it was launched for the first time in India uh, in partnership with Nike. Second brand on this page is a brand called Urban Decay. It is a iconic cosmetics brand, again from the U.S., uh, and again owned by L'Oreal. This brand has been introduced into India exclusively with Nike, and uh, Nike serves as importer, uh, importer, distributor, and retailer uh, for this brand. Inclu uh, uh, also adding to the list is Dr. Barbara Strum, which is a prestige premium uh, skincare brand out of Germany, as well as Colourpop, which is a Los Angeles-based global makeup brand. Uh, these brands as well are exclusive to the platform uh, and are also being imported and distributed solely by Nike. So on the right-hand side, you will see uh, a quick summary of some of the brands which we serve as importer and distributor for into India. Uh, to remind some of you, this business is, we call it as the Nike Global Store. Uh, these are brands for whom Nike handles not only the logistics and the registration and importing of the products, but also the distribution, go-to-market, marketing, pricing, and uh, customer service aspects of their business. So we serve as the brand's proxy in the country, <clears throat> and we have about 35 brands in this portfolio. We have shown the logos for about nine of them, which we feel are worth highlighting, some of which we have discussed in the past. Uh, this business of ours is growing at roughly 47% uh, year over year uh, and is a strong addition uh, to our portfolio as well as uh, emotes uh, against other competition. If I look at the premium uh, business as a whole, today we have uh, one of the largest, if not largest assortment of premium brands uh, in beauty in the country, 250 plus. Uh, this segment of our of our business is growing at about a 50% CAGR over the past three years. And almost uh, roughly a fourth, a quarter to about a third of our GMB comes from what we define as premium and prestige beauty brands. Next slide, please. 
spending a minute on our physical retail business, we believe that brick and mortar retail continues to be incredibly important for beauty brands uh, as they look to partner with select retailers. They are looking for retailers who can give them both scale online as well as scale offline. And today in India, Nike is one of those players. If I look at our store count, it has increased uh, by almost 80 stores over the past two years. And we have opened roughly about 39 to 40 stores in the past 12 months. Today, we cover over 64 cities across uh, our 174 stores, and we cover about 1.7 lakh square feet of retail space. In terms of the key callouts for this business this quarter, I would say is a strong improvement in profitability. Uh, the retail segment of our BPC business is showing healthy growth at the EBITDA level of about 35% year over year. And today it contributes to roughly 9% of our overall GMV. Now I will mention that it's not uh, an exact apples to apples comparison. Uh, we have over 3000 brands online and about 80 store, 80 brands in our stores. So for the 80 brands, which we keep in our physical retail stores, the contribution of physical retail to the overall GMV mix is much higher than 9%. Finally, we see our stores as a very powerful channel, uh, especially for premium beauty brands. Today, we have over 85 premium beauty brands in our physical retail stores, and 65% plus uh, is the share of uh, the GMV in our retail stores that comes from premium prestige brands. As a result, we have what we believe to be strong uh, productivity uh, and throughput, and our GMV per square foot per, per month is roughly 4,000. 109 rupees. On the bottom left, you'll see a breakdown of our store network. We have about 74 Nike on-trend stores, 67 Nike luxury stores, and 33 Nike kiosks. And the split between metros and non-metros is about 94 stores in non-metro towns and 80 stores in metro towns. Q3 is uh, also the quarter in which we host our flagship beauty sale of the year. Uh, it is called the Nike Cupping Friday Sale. Uh, this year, this sale has continued to grow from strength to strength. As you can see, we execute the sale now across not only the Nike Beauty app, uh, but also the Nike Beauty physical retail stores, as well as both Nike Fashion and Nike Man platforms. So this is truly a one Nike uh, sale. Uh, this year, we generated over 400 million uh, in terms of social uh, and media reach. Uh, this is across roughly a seven-day uh, sale. And we had 50 million unique visitors who visited uh, either our stores or our apps across the period and duration of the sale. To give you a sense of how the sale has scaled over the past five years, you can see on the top right bar chart that uh, the GMV that we generate uh, across this sale, the seven-day sale, has increased almost 10 times uh, in the past five years. Uh, and today, again, as I've said earlier, a key focus of Nikas is to premiumize the beauty consumption in India, and that is reflecting even during key sale moments such as these. You can see that one third of the GMB for this sale came from premium brands. Uh, Thirty-two percent was the growth uh, for premium brands in terms of GMB versus uh, the sale uh, last year, and sixty-seven percent growth in offline uh, uh, sales for the, uh, during the period of this Pink Friday. In terms of Nike fashion on the bottom right-hand side, you see that in, in a matter of two years, the GMV that we're generating from this sale has scaled almost five times in just the two-year period, so also very healthy growth. There is a 29% jump in order conversion that we see on the Nike fashion platform during this sale, and 120% plus growth year over year uh, in terms of key categories of women, women's Western wear, GMV versus last year's sale. And again, women's bags and footwear, another standout category for the Nike fashion platform during this year's Pink Friday sale, showing about 150% growth year over year. Next slide, please. And with that, I'll hand it over to Advaita to take you through the fashion slides. Thanks. Thanks, Anshit. <clears throat> so I'll uh, take us through a couple of fashion slides here. Starting off with some metrics, in terms of GMV, the quarter three ended at about 1,000 crores uh, in terms of GMV, and that's a 45% two-year CAGR. 
it's up about 40 percent year on year. From an NSV perspective, you see that we've ended the quarter at 275 crores for Q3 with a two-year CAGR of 35%. Moving on to our annual unique transacting consumers on the bottom left, you can see that we're now at 2.9 million customers as of the end of quarter three, uh, demonstrating a 36% two-year CAGR. And finally, on the right-hand side, orders have grown at about 25% CAGR over the last two years, taking us to 2. Uh, zero uh, million orders in the quarter um, itself. So overall, it's been a very strong performance, I think, for the fashion business. And on the next slide, we'll see some underlying metrics which are showing very strong improvement. And I think it's also important to note that a lot of this uh, strong top line growth has been uh, in the background of a pretty muted fashion environment for a lot of the other competition. So here on this chart, we show a couple of metrics uh, which are demonstrating, you know, the improved profitability that's also coming through. So if we start on the left-hand side and we look at the order to unique visitor conversion, we can see a very strong upward trajectory consistently over the last five to six quarters. We're now at 3.2% as the unique visitor conversion, which is up from 2.3% um, exactly a year ago. On the bottom, right below that, you can see that uh, we're now seeing about 50% of our GMV coming from repeat customers or existing customers. Uh, this this is a good marker of, you know, sort of customer love being built and our retention numbers are improving, um, whichever cohort we look at. And uh, these two things combined, that is conversion rate and the increase in repeat, is actually allowing us to bring our marketing expenses down, which brings me to the middle chart. So in this middle chart, you can see that the marketing expenses are coming down, again, consistently over the last couple of quarters. We're now at 23.9% of NSV being spent on marketing. And finally, on the right hand side, you know, the improvements in marketing and, uh, you know, there are other line items as well that have improved uh, is really driving a good expansion in the contribution margin. And um, we're now at 6% for Q3, which is up from 0.9% a year ago. Uh, I do think net net, it is the commitment to our positioning, the positioning that is to be differentiated, to be curated, to believe in the premiumization of India's fashion story, which is allowing us to deliver the improvement in metrics. And, um, you know, I'm feeling pretty good about Q3, both from the point of view that the growth has come through, uh, along with improvements in contribution margins. So I think it's been a good performance from the team in that regard. Moving on. The big highlight we want to talk about from the fashion business perspective is the partnership that we've uh, just struck with Foot Locker. Mm -hmm. It was in the news a couple of Weeks ago, Foot Locker, as you may know, is a, a U.S.-based company, $8 billion in top line, Fortune 500 company, and a very popular multi-brand footwear specialty retailer. Uh, they're very well known for their sneaker culture positioning and their sports uh, positioning. And their top brands include brands like Nike, jo the Jordan franchise within Nike, Adidas, Puma, and so forth. It goes without saying on the next slide <clears throat> that obviously sneakers and sports in this country is exploding. And we are seeing that the search trends for sneakers in India are growing at about 5x over the last couple of years. Um, and so Nike Fashion definitely wants to play in the sneaker trend that the country is seeing. We think it's a great opportunity, which will likely be about $4.5 billion by 2027. And so it's in the context of finding a great retail partner in Foot Locker as well as in the context of the trends we're seeing in sneakers, both on our site and more generally, that on the next slide, we're really proud and excited to announce our partnership with Foot Locker, where we are going to serve as the exclusive e-commerce partner. We're going to run their India website, as well as uh, provide a shop and shop format within the Nike Fashion and Nike Man apps. And our offering will include footwear, apparel, accessories. I think it's a really strong move uh, from the point of view that we will get access to some fantastic assortment which will strengthen our positioning as being, you know, premium curated and now also a very strong player in the sneaker and sports space. With that, I'll hand back over to FN to take us through the House of Brands slides. Uh, I thought you were going to take us through the House of Brands. Okay, sure. Moving on. So I think as a reminder, uh, this is not the first time we're mentioning this. We do have a bouquet of our own brands that we're very proud of. We don't call them private labels. These are truly our own brands that we're hoping and aiming to build with a lot of consumer love in the country. We have 13 brands on the beauty side. On the left-hand side, you can see a lot of these we've built in-house, uh, some we've acquired. Uh, three of them have hit actually considerable scale, and you can see those uh, starred 
you know, in the top on the top side. So Nika Cosmetics is a 400 crore annualized brand. K Beauty is a 200 crore annualized brand. And Dot and Key has hit a 500 crore mark. So very proud of sort of the traction we're seeing in a couple of these brands. On the right hand side in fashion, we've spoken about this before, but we do believe that own brands in fashion have a particularly important role to play. Uh, the customers are starved of brands. And so if we can create a lot of good assortment, which, which is what we're trying to do, um, I think it can be a win-win both for the customer and for the platform. Here as well, two brands have had breakthrough performance. 20 Dresses has hit over 100 crore run rate, as well as Naked, which has also crossed 100 crores. I think uh, particularly in fashion, the numbers have to be seen in the light that a lot of these brands which have started in the last two to three years. So their performance in terms of scale is quite commendable. Uh, we are really trying to double down on our own brand strategy, uh, really strengthening the org and our capabilities from an innovation, creativity, marketing perspective, so that we can become a true house of brands and a true consumer brands company uh, and build some wonderful brands through this. Moving on. Here we talk about the top line um, in BPC, in particular for these own brands. So you can see in quarter three, uh, this vertical delivered 315 crores of GMV, which is a 34% two-year CAGR and a 40% year-on-year growth. In terms of the contribution to the overall BPC segment, it's 13.3%. And on the right-hand side, you can see similar numbers for the NSV level, which has now hit 194 crore NSV at a 32% CAGR. On the bottom, I'll draw your attention to this pie chart, which shows that a significant portion of the sales are obviously coming from Nika. So Nika online is 53%. Nika physical stores is 13%, but 34% is also coming from other third-party channels, predominantly GTMT. And we do believe that, you know, for these brands to stand on their own two feet, they do need external distribution as well. Moving on. On the fashion side, um, again, it's been a good performance over the last two years with this vertical hitting about 116 crores from a GMV perspective and 46 crores from an NSE perspective for Q3. Uh, showing about a 57 to 60% CAGR, two-year CAGR uh, for both metrics. And from a channel mix perspective on the bottom, you can see that 54% is coming from our own channels and 46% is coming from other parties, whether it's a GT, MT, other e-commerce players and so forth. We can move on. So with that, I'll hand over to Vishal to walk us through the EB2B business superstore by Nika. Thank you. Hi. Thanks, Advita. Uh, next slide, please. So, look, EB2B is a very young business, but every month, every quarter, it is going from strength to strength. As you can see, in, in the last two years, we have grown our GMV by more than 31x, our NSV by more than 40x, and all that is coming through... Uh, expansion of our customer base and we have 35x increase in transacting retailers and 38x increase in number of orders per quarter and now we have hit 337,000 orders per quarter and you can see that it's a business which is growing quarter on quarter as you know and we we are improving our importance to the retailers as well as to the brands that we serve because ultimately it's a scale business. And if you see the next slide, you will see the benefits of scale coming through because while we scale, we are super mindful of improving the profitability. And, you know, it becomes a virtuous cycle where scale improves profitability and profitability allows you to improve scale. You can see that between GMV and NSV alone, we have reduced our leakages by 40% yeah, through very rigorous uh, operational control and also improving our service level to the retailers, which means that we have much lower damage returns and returns by our customers. There is some improvement also in the conversion because of uh, lesser discounts and lesser schemes, which means which is lower retailer margin, which means better conversion because it's uh, less discounts. Uh, there is uh, a 13 percent increase year on year on the uh, AOV, and uh, this tells us that our importance to the retailer is increasing because the retailers are giving more and more of their business to us 
which again becomes a, a virtuous cycle because we get bigger orders and bigger orders are more profitable and we get more lo loyal customers. Importantly, 42% of our turnover is what we call high margin featured brand, which helps us improve our profitability. And you can see the improvement that we have made in our contribution margin, which is coming from this profitability as well as reduction in costs. We have reduced 580 BIPs in overall fulfillment cost through lower warehouse cost, lower fulfillment freight cost, as well as much lower packaging cost, which we have reduced by a uh, half. We have also improved our uh, field force productivity and reduced uh, our sales and uh, distribution expenses by 170 BIPs. So overall significant improvement in our contribution margin. Next slide. And like I said, this comes a lot by improving our service to the retailers because it is a service business. And from 10 warehouses, we have moved to 13 warehouses. You can see three new warehouses, Patna, uh, Chennai and Bengaluru. And where, you know, we are closer to customers, which means uh, lower cost, lower service time and uh, improved uh, happiness of the retailer and improved margins for us. So we have total two and a half lakh square feet and we are covering 950 cities. Yeah, so month on month, uh, very high, you know, uh, scaling up of the business, but scaling up with profitability. Over to Ganesh. Thank you, Vishal. And good evening, everyone. As you can see, all our business verticals have delivered strong growth in quarter three FY24, despite macro pressures around discretionary sectors. With that context, I would like to take you through the financial highlights for the quarter. As you can see, our company delivered healthy growth on both revenue at quarter three and nine months level, growing at 22% and 23% respectively. Our gross margin came in a little lower at 42.5% this quarter versus 43.4% in Q3 FY23. The drop is primarily on account of the increased mix in our eB2B business at a consolidated level, as also on account of some softness in service income in the BPC business. Our EBITDA margins have expanded to 5.5% in quarter 3 FY24, led by improvement in our fulfillment expenses, employee expenses, and other expenses. And this improvement has been achieved in spite of higher ESOP costs and costs pertaining to our omnichannel launch in the GCC region, which cumulatively accounted for 0.6%. We have greater details on, on the flow between EBITDA margin and this adjusted EBITDA margin, uh, which I just mentioned about of 0.6% uh, in the latest slides. Our PBT for quarter 3 FY24 stood at 26.5 crore, growing strongly at 109%. And our PAT in quarter 3 FY24 stood at 17.6 crore, again with a strong growth of 107%. Going on to the next slide. Here you can see a snapshot of our consolidated PNL for the quarter as well as for nine months. We have achieved improvements in our profitability through improvement in fulfillment expenses, improved scale efficiencies on employee costs, and optimization on GNA. Moving ahead onto the next slide. Here you can see the vertical reporting, which gives detail of the individual businesses. The operating leverages have helped us to drive efficiencies in our contribution margin. Our fashion contribution margins, as you can see, have smartly expanded by 510 basis points YOY, while our others' verticals have also narrowed down the contribution uh, uh, margin impact and have expanded 344 basis points. Going to the next slide. This slide highlights how our business verticals have been consistently improving on profitability. As you can see, there is a healthy, profitable growth across all the three business verticals. 
and while on an overall basis the ebitda margin does not fully reflect this growth which is seen on account of all the all the verticals the primary reason being the e b2b business as we can see has been growing significantly in terms of salience and it's upwards of 7% at this point as you can see in the bottom right chart moving ahead this slide further elaborates the movement between contribution margin and ebitda which is primarily on account of employee expenses and other expenses these expenses as we have shared previously were higher in fy23 since we were in a stage of investing ahead of the curve they have started moderating over the last few quarters and those benefits are starting to show up another point to note over here is that almost 40% of our gna spends are on web and tech investments and with the rest of the gna spends continuing to be stable moving ahead here you can see the ebitda to pbt bridge as you can see depreciation amortization expenses at 248 million this quarter at a 45% buy or buy uh is on a on account of expansion of retail stores and expansion of our warehouse capacity over the last year as a percentage to net revenue these costs have increased by 22 basis points lease costs both in terms of depreciation and amortization as well as finance costs have been relatively stable interest costs costs have moved broadly in line with expansion in business and resulting increase in working capital and being offset by higher interest on the investments that we hold and this has resulted in ebitda margins improve expansion and aided by dna the overall pbt margins have improved by more than 60 basis points we just continue to focus on growing top line as well as in terms of continuing to grow profitably moving ahead what you can see on this slide is a summary of the proposals which were approved by the board of directors of fsn e-commerce at the board meeting held today a brief summary of the proposals the first one is infusion of add uh, additional equity of 150 crore in nika fashion nika fashion uh, uh, has been scaling up quite nicely and at this point uh, uh, we feel it's appropriate to capitalize this company so that's the driver behind this uh, uh, this proposal the second one is consolidation of the fashion owned brands business into the parent company and this will happen over the next few quarters and in terms of holding structure it will bring it on par with the holding structure for own brands that we have in the bpc business the third one is a demerger of the e b2b business from fsn distribution to nika e retail this again helps in streamlining the holding structure simplifying the structure whereby the online beauty business gets consolidated into a single entity so that's the summary of the proposals which have been approved by the board today um, with that i would like to thank everyone for joining this call and i would like to pass on the mic to sheila to initiate the q and a session Thank you, Ganesh. Uh, operator, we can open up for the Q and A session. Thank you. We'll now begin the question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press the raise hand button found on Zoom, or if you've joined us on the phone, please press star followed by one. Before asking your question, please introduce yourself, providing your name and your organisation name. Please limit yourself to a maximum of two questions, so we can accommodate as many people as possible. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for just a moment. while the question queue assembles okay we will take our first question from zoom the first question comes from sachin dixit so please introduce yourself and your company name please go ahead please do ensure that you are unmuted locally
unfortunately we are not getting any response so we will move on to the next question if you would like to ask your question please do re-raise your hand the next question comes from the line of Vijit Jain so please go ahead your line is open yeah hi thanks uh, for the opportunity uh, my question is on uh, the BPC segment I would uh, you know uh, it the presentation shows and suggests that the premium segment within BPC uh, grew ahead of your overall BPC GMV growth. And uh, you did, while you did note pressure in Mastige segment in your opening remarks and in the press release and trading update as well, I'm just wondering uh, uh, on uh, why the BPC gross margins look a tad weak given the premium segment did so well. And uh, did uh, related question to that, did discounting in your own brands go up further in 3Q versus 2Q and uh, additionally did retailer margins uh, in the in, in your partner brand uh, see any kind of a change QOQ you know as the retail as the brand partners uh, kind of combated the weak environment in India thank you that's my first question uh, so I'll just answer about the our private label brand discounting and then I'll pass it on to Anshit so, yes, I have to say that our private label brand discounting did go up like every other brand in the environment, especially the mastige brands. Uh, and uh, to that extent, that is built into that. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I I now pass it on to Anshit on, on commenting on the retailer. Yeah, so maybe I'll take, uh, I'll take the question in order. Um, <clears throat> I think a couple of different aspects you touched upon. So, the first is, you know, regarding the, the increasing or the faster growth of premium and prestige brands on the platform. Um, so I think, uh, look, the reality is, is that premium slash prestige beauty was a very small percent of the overall BPC market. So it was incredibly under indexed. So it is growing off of a smaller base, uh, base. So there is more opportunity for those brands to continue to grow faster than the platform. That's one. Second is as Nika, we strongly believe in continuing to uh, drive awareness for and continue to, uh, you know, do business in the premium prestige space because uh, these are the kind of brands that drive strong customer repeat and loyalty. And as I said in the beginning, it's also uh, just generally better uh, unit economics for us. So we're happy with the results that we're seeing with the prestige brands. But again, it's coming off of a very small base. So, uh, you know, generally the whole market needs to grow. And uh, that's when we'll start to potentially see better uh, or see positive impact from a gross margin perspective. With regards to mass and mass these brands, I think as many of you know, the commentary coming from some of the listed uh, names is that uh, the demand has been soft in rural markets. And I think as a result, there was an urgency to get short term uh, revenue <coughs> growth uh, and as uh, which led them to spend more money on discounts and promos than on marketing, uh, marketing investments on platform. So some of the marketing investment dollars moved from on-site marketing to promo spend. Uh, and I think that's probably a short-term, uh, you know, a short-term um, impact that should revert hopefully in the medium term. Uh, I think FN covered a bit about own brands uh, discounting. And finally, on retailer margin, being impacted by partner brands, I think the short answer is no in terms of uh, product margin that we receive from our brand partners. These are long-term contracts, uh, tend to be anywhere from three to five years and tend to be uh, renewed at the end of that period of time. So no impact on retailer margin um, uh, on that front. So I hope I answered all your questions. Yeah, thanks, Anchit. Uh, my second question is just looking at the marketing spends for you guys in the BPC segment, right? I know this is a seasonally strongest quarter uh, for business activity, everything for you guys. Uh, so there's a seasonal QOQ uptick to be expected, but it just uh, looks uh, from a YOY perspective also up quite nicely at 45-50%. So should we read that uh, in conjunction with your comments on, uh, you know, uh, how, you know, uh, competition was behaving in the own brand space uh, or is there more to it? So discounts will are not captured in, in, uh, in this, in right. this uh, line item, right? So this is, uh, 
it, I don't think uh, it's got anything to do with our own brand's uh, 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 promo strategy to compete against uh, competition. What I would say is that, uh, as we've said in the past, we're very strong believers in uh, in category expansion. Uh, and uh, if Nika doesn't continue to invest behind growing the beauty category in India, uh, then really, I don't know who, who, who will take on that initiative. So we feel strongly that as a large beneficiary of this category and as a large player, uh, uh, it is important for us to continue to grow the ecosystem and and events such as Nike Land, but many more. We just showed you one example of Nike Land, but there are other such events which we hold throughout the year, uh, which are category building uh, initiatives that, of course, uh, do carry some amount of cost uh, alongside that, and that is 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 showing up in the marketing uh, expense line item. That's one. The second and probably the largest share, of course, is our strategic focus on customer acquisition. So for us, a new customer acquisition is a strategic priority and we definitely pushed the pedal on that in Q3, given that it was a festive time, given that we were seeing good traction, uh, we wanted to invest in new customer acquisition. Uh, as we go into obviously a new fiscal year, we want to be uh, aggressive on acquiring those new customers uh, into the beauty world, which you know we are helping to create the market. So we also want to ensure we are capitalizing on those customers and, and, and acquiring them early on. So I think the increase in marketing expenses is, is a combination of the two, uh, customer acquisition spends, uh, as well as uh, category building initiatives. But if there's anything else, either Ganesh or FN would like to add, please feel free. Yeah, and uh, just my last question, I suppose, uh, uh, as you look forward into you know the calendar year 2024 or FY25, uh, can you talk a little bit about where do you want the overall business margins to kind of uh, go? Is there a target uh, or is there any kind of a guidance you can give on on, the, on those fronts? That will be extremely helpful. Thank you. I think it's too forward looking for us to be able to address like that. But I think, uh, you know, I think uh, you can see how we are trying to manage all our elements of both margins as well as uh, cost elements. All right, thank you. Those were my questions. Thank you. The next question today comes from the line comes from the line of Vivek M. So please go ahead. Your line is now open. Hi, good evening. My friend from Jeffrey. Uh, you're continuing with the questions on uh, on BPC. Just to get it right, uh, the gross profit uh, margin uh, quarter on quarter or uh, year on year, which are down about 60 basis points, that is essential because of own labels. Uh, it's not because of uh, it's not because of you know uh, Nike funding part of the uh, part of the you know discounts or promotion. All of that is taken care by the brand. Sorry, Vivek, we're uh, we losing you. If you don't mind, just uh, restating the question. If you don't mind, I think you're cutting in and out. I'm sorry. Am I am I audible now? Yes. yes. Sorry about that. So, Anshit, my question to you is: uh, This uh, 60 basis point quarter on quarter and year on or year on year decline in gross margin that's only because of uh, you know own brands, uh, and this has nothing to do with the with the beauty brands on the platform. Is that understanding correct? So I, I didn't catch the entire question, but I understood that it's, it refers to the uh, roughly, uh, you know, 80, 90 basis point uh, decline in the gross margin for the BPC business. So what I would say is that, um, as I mentioned uh, in my answer to the previous question, some of that is coming from, um, you know, a large mass and mass these brands moving some of their advertising spend away from advertising and into the promo bucket because generally companies, uh, consumer companies tend to have one large a &P budget and, you know, the use of the proceeds, the use of the cash is fungible between either advertising or promo spend. And as I mentioned, given the other pressure they're facing in other parts of their business and markets, there has been a slight uh, higher emphasis on promo spend than on advertising in this past quarter. Uh, so some of the impact is because of that. And um, uh, there, uh, there is no real impact of the consumer brand. I think if you look at our own brands, they have, in fact, gained uh, a little bit of share year over year in terms of their contribution to our business. So that is not really the impact that is uh, playing out here. It's mostly, as I said, just some 
softness on the uh, marketing income this quarter. Okay, and Anjit, because uh, because Nike is a one P platform, so essentially buy and sell it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, because it's a one P bid. If brands are discounting more, do they actually you know uh, actually adjust it uh, so that it goes out of their pocket and not your pocket, so that you are protected? How does that happen in the real world? So again, I think I caught some parts of the question, but yes, uh, we are a 1P model. Um, but uh, as we've said historically that for Nika, retailer funded discounting, we believe is very short term uh, approach to doing business. And it's not the right thing in the long term uh, if you're looking to grow the category and to drive uh, what we call as the art of retailing, which is our core uh, focus. And uh, it's short term gain, but we think longer term it attracts the wrong uh, quality of customer and it drives the wrong type of customer behavior. That being said, of course, if any of our brand partners would like to pass on discounts to the consumers, that is totally uh, their decision uh, and uh, they do. So if there is a discount that the brand wishes to pass, that is passed directly onto the consumer. There is no role that Nike plays uh, in, on that front. Okay, sure. Uh, last question, uh, uh, 23.8% uh, you know, contribution margins in BCC. Uh, which, is, which is a seven quarter low. Do you think the margins have bottomed out at this level? Uh, we can't hear your questions. And uh, I think maybe we can give chance to others if they are in the queue. Okay, sure. Maybe you can I connect. Think, you can probably type it. Yeah, if you just type it in the chat box, if you're having some connection issues, we can address it uh, maybe a little bit later. Thank you. The next question today comes from the line of Nahal Jam. We do request that each person introduce themselves and their company name. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Am I audible first of all? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. This is Nihal Jam here from Nuama. Uh, my first question was on the BPC bit itself. If I look at uh, the contribution margin for uh, the BPC segment, over the last couple of years, obviously, the fulfillment from uh, lever from fulfillment expenses come in. Uh, just wanted to get a sense that where do we see this contribution margin stabilizing in the longer term and what would be the future levers to achieve that? So maybe I, I'll, yeah, go ahead. No, I think, uh, I think these are very healthy contribution margin. And uh, I think uh, we will continue to work towards improving certain components if we find the ways to improve it, say if there is ability to improve fulfillment expenses. Even from here, we would definitely capture that. But I think one trend is clear that we would also like to invest more in marketing and building, uh, you know, driving the category adaption as well as all that Anchit has been saying so far. So like you saw that marketing expenses have also gone up over the last year. So I think there will be, uh, there is no, there is no desire to keep improving the contribution margin, but to grow the category and improve the prospects of the business. Anshit, anything you would like to add? Yeah, no, I think you summarized it well, which is the priority number one for the BPC segment going forward will be our growth because we feel that we've managed to uh, deliver pretty healthy contribution margins. Uh, but we are incredibly optimistic and excited about the opportunity that exists in beauty in India today. The kind of uh, focus that India is now receiving from global beauty brands, uh, the kind of customer uh, behavior which we are witnessing, the kind of premiumization that is un that is uh, that the market is undergoing. So we feel there is no time like the present to continue to reinvest in the business. Um, so I think that's priority number one will be on driving more customer acquisition, bringing more customers into the world of beauty. And also there is a, obviously a cost associated with retaining uh, customers and driving more customer delight. So investments by us on, um, on obviously customer acquisition and retention, but also on customer service as well as fulfillment. Uh, I think it's imperative for us to continue that. Uh, and you will see more of that to come. So we feel that, uh, we growth is priority number one, but of course, if there is any, if there are efficiencies that we could find across um, uh, fulfillment, across marketing, that will 100% be done. But it will uh, also those proceeds will be reinvested in continuing to drive outside growth 
and growing the overall beauty market. So we feel that where the contribution margin is today is probably a healthy place for us to be in the in the in the short to medium term. Of course, longer term, if things like you know uh, generative AI and the other uh, tech uh, automation capabilities play out, you could of course see meaningful savings across fulfillment, the marketing, employee cost, etc. I'd like to just add, Ganesh here, uh, is that the contribution margins which you have been seeing at present, they are in line with the historical trend that, that we have had. And as Anchit mentioned, the fact that we have been able to bring in efficiencies on fulfillment, etc., over the last few quarters is also creating room uh, in terms of our ability to invest behind the business, invest in customer acquisition, etc. Understood. Just, just one last question and related uh to the larger business that I am assuming that based on the discussions that the priority number one across all the three segments remains, I'm assuming GMV slash NS3 and margin would be lower or lower in the pecking order at this point in time. Would that be a right thought in terms of how we are looking at the business for the years? No, we are not saying that the margins would be lower. We are saying that we are focused on the growth and uh, we will continue to invest in the business, be it for, uh, you know, market creation, be it even faster deliveries and delight to the customers. So I think what we are trying to say is that the objective right now is not trying to push the contribution margin higher. That's clear. Thank you so also, much. Also, each business is at a different phase of its growth and its profit uh, profitability, right? So we feel that the, if you look at the contribution margin for the BPC vertical, uh, it is increased by almost 300 to 400 basis points over the past two years. So there has been significant improvement there and it's in a very healthy place. So priority number one is growth. And I think if you ask fashion, priority number one is also growth, but there, there is of course more work to be done on the profitability side. And I think that Vita spoke about the good work they've done in the past quarter. So I think obviously both are important. The weightages between growth and profitability can be different for each of the business segments based on where each business is on its own, uh, on its own journey. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next but question. I think, consolid, I think at the consolidated level, based on improvement in other businesses like fashion and B2B, we will see uh, that there will be greater coverage of uh, costs, fixed costs. And as a result, the EBITDA margin at the consolidated level, we can be optimistic about. But we, it, it's not. it's not that... We're going to try to maximize it. We're going to try to continue to invest in all the businesses and then try and, you know, manage for growth as well as profitability. I think the best slide to, uh, you know, if you go back to the uh, NSV uh, mix slide uh, over the past years, you'll see that just two years ago, if you look at uh, FY22, I mean, BPC accounted for 85% of the total uh, NSV mix. And today that number is 78%. So despite the fashion and B2B verticals, which, currently have a lower uh, uh, profitability profile, uh, them gaining and taking, uh, increasing their mix of revenue to the overall business over the past two years. Despite that, I think the consolidated, consolidated profitability has held up. Um, uh, so I think it goes to show you that, you know, beauty's profitability continues to remain healthy and fashion and B2B are not only are they growing the top line faster, but they are also managing to turn a corner on profitability and drive better margins. Thank you. The next question today comes from the line of Percy Penthaki. So please do introduce yourself and your company before asking your question. Uh, hi, uh, am I audible? Yes. Hello. Please. Yeah. Yeah. This is Percy Penthaki from IIFL. Uh, uh, my first question is on the, uh, uh, one of costs, uh, that you mentioned, uh, that is the GCC ramp up and the ESOP costs, uh, they total about 60 basis points. So one is, can you disaggregate the two? And secondly, uh, just wanted to understand, uh, how much of this will be recurring? Uh, is it that there's a big, uh, ESOP charge out, uh, this quarter and then from next quarter onwards, uh, it's going to be close to zero or, uh, will it continue at the same level? as what it is this quarter and also the same question on the GCC investments, uh, 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 what kind of uh, percentage of uh, uh, total revenues do you want to sort of cap the GCC investments at? So this is my first question. 
Um, I think Ganesh, you want to explain yeah. the first. Yeah. So, so firstly, as far as the ESOP costs are concerned, the cost which has come into the PNL this quarter is about uh, uh, seven odd crores. And while this will be a continuing cost, uh, given the way ESOP accounting happens over the next three years, this will uh, this will be gradually tapering down. So that's that's the way that's the way this cost will uh, uh, progress. It will be a continuing one, but uh, it will taper down over the next three years. As far as uh, the uh, GCC uh, costs are concerned, uh, we should bear in mind that uh, there is a stores rollout plan, etc., uh, uh, which is happening as far as GCC is concerned. So uh, these are these are the initial costs. About uh, three and a half crores is the amount, and this would this would vary going forward depending on how the stores rollout happens. Okay. Uh, my second question is on the uh, BPC uh, NSV growth, which is uh, over the last two, three quarters, uh, 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 sort of around that 20% mark. And before that, it used to be closer to the 30% mark. And uh, even in our analyst meet, I think uh, the expectation uh, for uh, five-year Kager was somewhere in the region of about 27% or so. Uh, so in light of this, I wanted to understand what is the reason why the growth has dipped by about uh, 10 percentage points and also uh, why uh, 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 basically it's tracking below our uh, sort of uh, medium term aspirations. I, I understand the uh, discounting part uh, uh, to some extent, but do you think that this goes away in one or two quarters as the discounting annuals rises and then if the GMV growth is like 24, 25, we see the same NSV growth, or do you think that uh, uh, there will still be pressure on NSV uh, 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 for some reason? And secondly, just wanted to understand in context of if we see the consumption space, uh, there is uh, pressure at uh, uh, mass and consumption, uh, FMCG products, etc. But your average ticket price per item is in the region of about 300 rupees, which is like the top decile of the entire uh, FMCG space. And that space really, if I look at uh, not only FMCG, but any other premium consumption space, we have not seen any kind of slowdown. So in light of this also, I wanted to understand how uh, uh, the slowdown has happened over the last two, three quarters. Sorry for the long question. I hope I've been able to try and convey what uh, I'm uh, uh, sort of uh, trying to uh, get an answer to. Sure. I think I'll address it and then I'll ask Sanjit to chip in. So I want to say that uh, at no point are we saying that um, Nika's premium customer is affected by what is happening in terms of the rural slowdown. I don't think that's what we have said. I think we are saying three, four things. The first and foremost, what we are saying is that, and I think we've said that earlier also, that Currently, the e-commerce, the beauty online growth is slightly below the long-term average, and that is a post-COVID phenomenon where uh, uh, customers were very happy to be out and about and shop more in physical retail. So there has been a little bit of a sub-optimal growth in online BPC, and we believe that that will correct going forward. So that's first point number one. Uh, second point is that from the perspective of discounting, yes, the brands have had to discount because they've had channel adversity in other channels. And as a result, to chase growth, they are doing higher discounting to deliver on their growth targets uh, as a whole. And that is why the difference between GMV and NSV growth is coming. Because if the brands want to pass on the discount to the customer, that's what is reflected in the NSV. And uh, for, you're totally right that the current discounting is at a high level, which cannot sustain in the long run. And it is bound to stabilize or, um, you know, go down also in future, but definitely it cannot keep increasing from here. With that, if Anshit wants to come in on any additions. No, I think, uh, I think you covered it. Um, uh, look, I think we, you know, we were coming out of a pandemic when obviously e-commerce uh, uh, had uh, grown very rapidly and had taken share from physical retail. So some of the normalization is, what's been playing out and there has been a return to physical retail, uh, uh, you know, a healthy return to physical retail, which is good for us. It's a benefit to us because Nika also has one of the largest, uh, you know, networks of physical retail stores in the country. However, as I showed you earlier in the deck, 
uh, physical retail business for us is growing very well, but you know it's still uh, only nine percent of our overall GMV to our uh, BPC business, so it's not able to move the needle as much. So I think there's a little bit of normalization in the mix between online and offline, and as a result, um, maybe the uh, the mid to mid to long term growth at thirty percent plus for online uh, would is looking more like twenty five twenty six percent. So there is a slight decline as, as some of that demand moves back into the offline space. Please remember that beauty is a category also that well, that lends itself well to offline retail uh, as well. So it's, it's going to be a healthy mix and I think omni-channel retailers like us will benefit from that. But I would also like to stress on my other point, which I made earlier, which is that, you know, you mentioned some other uh, category, discretionary consumer categories that uh, may not be seeing a slowdown. I would also say that beauty is different in the sense that beauty is not a, a category which Indian consumers were historically familiar with. So the awareness for the consumption of uh, beauty in India is still, as I said, one of the lowest in the world on a per capita basis. So a lot of that work needs to be done. It's not an affordability issue. It's an awareness issue. Uh, we always say that consumption of beauty in India is a result of three factors. Uh, one is affordability, second is availability, and third is awareness. And I think the affordability issue is being addressed as the GDP per capita improves. Availability, Nika is bringing the best brands from all around the world into the country. So that's being fixed as well. Finally, the awareness needs to improve. If you look at other economies, the frequency of purchase of beauty products, the number of beauty products bought per, uh, per customer is, uh, is much more significant than India. So it's an awareness issue that, again, we're working on uh, through category growing initiatives like Nike Land and of course a lot more that we do. Uh, thank you. One last quick question, if I might be allowed. Uh, any comments on uh, your market share amongst the uh, 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 e-tailing BPC e-tailing uh, space with uh, some new competition coming up uh, over a two-year period? Are your market shares uh, in the uh, uh, BPC e-tailing uh, space uh, constant or have they gone down? So as you know, there's none of the other uh, uh, beauty e-tailers are listed. So it's you know it's difficult for me to say uh, with 100% confidence, but of course we have enough market intelligence and enough uh, uh, you know understanding of the business. What I would say is that we don't think our market share has declined at all because of the new competition. Uh, when we, from our understanding, some of the horizontals have been, uh, you know, high single digits, low double digit growth for the category. Um, and the new entrants still are very, very small uh, and are not uh, not really impacting us uh, from a market share perspective. Um, so we would, our understanding is we have probably grown in line, if not slightly faster than the online BPC market growth. And so our market share is probably very healthy and in line with uh, with previous years. Uh, but as I said, also remember that we are also a very large offline retailer of beauty. And there we continue to take market share because we are expanding our stock count very rapidly and becoming one of the largest networks of beauty retailers offline as well. So I think in aggregate, definitely market share has probably improved year over year. Uh, thanks very much, Anjit and uh, Falguni. That's all from me. Thank you. The next question today comes from the line of Abhishek Banjari. So please go ahead and introduce yourself before asking your question. Um, hi, uh, this is Abhishek uh, from ISEC. Uh, first question uh, goes out to Ganesh. Uh, so uh, this uh, uh, infusion of equity into Nike fashion, uh, this is essentially a non-cash transfer, right? So basically, uh, the whatever was given in the form of debt is being converted into equity. Is that uh, correct? Yeah, that's right. Your understanding is right. While there is a 150 crore equity which which goes in, it goes into repayment of debt. And 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 repayment of debt given by the parent company. So it's so in a sense, in a sense, it's a conversion of uh, loan into equity. We are capitalizing the uh, fashion business. Understood. And. Uh... The slum sale, there will be some cash transfer, right? That's right. Yeah, this is based on a valuation which has been done by Grant Thornton. And on that basis, uh, there will be an actual consideration which will get paid. Okay, so overall it is 
correct to think that probably the contribution margin of the fashion business will uh, slightly improve after these uh, uh, changes. Yeah, again, again, uh, 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 when you look at the fashion entity in terms of uh, uh, the fact that there will be a cash infusion which goes into the fashion entity, the overall overall profit uh, uh, profile of uh, uh, fashion uh, 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 fashion entity will improve to the extent of lower interest cost primarily. Understood. That's very helpful. Uh, now, uh, uh, Anshit, if I may ask a question on. Uh, the growth aspect that you were talking to and uh, one of the earlier callers also alluded to, uh, it is with regards to where you see the growth really coming from. Uh, and uh, basically, just to uh, say, say this quarter, you saw a faster growth in the premium side of, uh, of beauty, right? So do you think that is a more sustainable trend? Do you see the premium side growing faster? And uh, also in terms of customer profiles, right, I believe you already have an exposure to uh, slightly more premium customers, right? So whom do you see really buying more? Are the more premium customers buying more or do you really see uh, growth from the value customers that you have? So maybe I'll start with um, on the on the prestige premium side, as I said, Today, prestige premium is less than 10% of overall BPC spends in India. So it's very under index. So this will continue to grow. Uh, and it will continue to grow in, at a rate faster than mass and mass teach because mass and mass teach brands are very, very well distributed and are already at, at a reasonably large scale if you at least look at a few of the large ones uh, across India, right? So uh, the premiumization of beauty is a trend that's happened globally, especially if you look at China over the past 15 years, and India has not even begun that trend yet. So the premiumization of beauty will happen, and Nike is well placed to uh, to be a, a beneficiary of that because, as you mentioned, we do have a large percent of the of the premium uh, consumers in India today are currently Nike shoppers. However, that being said, uh, we also have a very large base of of uh, non-premium and non-prestige shoppers, and in fact, that is a massive opportunity for us to continue to acquire customers in the country because. You know, today's value shopper is tomorrow's prestige shopper. As I said, it's not really an affordability issue. It's more of an awareness issue. And that's the work that Nike does. Once we acquire customers, our ability to use CRM and CLM capabilities to improve uh, the unit economics, improve the annual consumption value of our customers, improve the average order values of our customers uh, is quite meaningful. And you've always, you know, uh, we've always said that uh, our repeat buyers tend to have higher uh, average order values than our new buyers. So that's work that we're able to do once we acquire the customer. But I think the biggest uh, the biggest opportunity, again, I'll say it again, is you have even the existing Nike customers today, even if they're shopping premium products or they're shopping value products, they are still uh, under-indexing in terms of their frequency of purchase, their number of items in a cart, uh, their category width, their annual consumption value is still uh, comparably uh, lower than what it could be. So you will see ACVs of existing customers improve if we do the right things as a company. Um, and you will see a lot of customers who are currently not shopping beauty at all. You have a lot of personal care shoppers in India. India has historically been a personal care market. But if you look at other comparable markets, personal, today's personal care shoppers, tomorrow's beauty shoppers. So there is a large number of consumers who will come into the beauty funnel. And again, that's Nike's responsibility, acquire these shoppers and sell them more beauty products. So bringing personal care and non-beauty buyers into the beauty shopping funnel is a massive opportunity. There are, uh, you know, millions and millions of customers who currently are either buying personal care or other lifestyle categories who, have, who are not consuming beauty yet. So that is also low hanging fruit for us. And that's where a lot of the investment in terms of new customer acquisition will go. And as I said, existing customers will be encouraged uh, to shop more frequently and shop more items per card, and that will be driven by a lot of the repeat customer repeat customer uh, mechanisms that we have in place. Understood. So you actually also touched upon the theme of the next question that I wanted to ask you, which is you kind of briefly uh, spoke about how uh, 
awareness is the issue not affordability and i i think that really ties well with the statement that you and uh, falguni ma'am made on the fact that you think the contribution margins for the bbc business are at an optimal level uh, so so does that really mean that the additional gains which you would be getting in the contribution margin due to scale that will be reinvested into uh, you know uh, advertising and uh, maybe more events like nike land which which we saw uh, is that the thinking I'm just trying to understand yeah i can say in the short term look in medium to longer term i don't want to give guidance in terms of will all efficiencies and savings be reinvested in marketing but we think short term definitely there is a massive opportunity for us to do category expansion work uh, and that's uh, where we are spending some of the money and the remainder is of course on as i said the millions and millions of uh, shoppers in india who are shopping online who are who are comfortable with uh using uh, digital forms of payment who are shopping uh large ticket items in other discretionary categories but are still not buying beauty there is tremendous opportunity for us to acquire those customers and do a lot of category awareness work on them so i think in the short term yes as we said we are uh, very early in our journey in terms of total number of transacting customers on our platform is still small compared to the opportunity in india so there is a lot of uh investment and a lot of work which we plan to do to bring more customers onto our platform and i think the advantage that we have is you know 10 years of being in this business we have tremendous uh we feel brand equity in the market we are recognized as thought leaders and almost being synonymous with beauty by the consumers so really building upon that good momentum and work we've done over the past 10 years as opposed to starting from scratch and trying to build legitimacy from scratch i think that's some something uh, that we have our work cut out for us but of course there is investment and to be made and time to be given to this uh, strategic priority and uh, uh, anshit uh, anshit i don't know whether you spoke about csms but when we did the education on csms as a routine cleanser moisturizer serum and uh, and sunscreen uh, i think what we found was that uh, uh, the growth in uh, sunscreen as well as serums on our platform was in excess of 60 to 100% like on serum 60 65% year on your growth and sunscreen was 100% year on your growth so i think a very wide education needs to be done to create the demand uh, and we are believers that per capita consumption of beauty can go from $15 to $50 with increasing per capita income and affordability is not an issue but it's the knowledge and education that is important and nike has done that from day one to grow the market perfect very clear thank you ma'am Adweta, uh, just uh, one one question to you also. Uh, so, uh, uh, amazing, uh, you know, improvement in the fashion business as of now. Uh, just one question that I have is on the new uh, uh, sneakers business that you seem to be getting in. Uh, and my understanding is, uh, generally globally, it is a more male centric kind of a product category. Uh, so, do we really have the kind of uh, customers or consumers on our platform who would uh, really be looking for uh, uh, sneakers or or are we trying something different here um so couple of thoughts first is uh, no i feel that sneakers is a you know great opportunity for women as well we see that uh, it's growing incredibly fast already with the category that we have on our site uh, so i wouldn't say that it's just a you know male dominated category i would say that there's potential in both genders for this to be a significant play uh, secondly um i do also see it as a you know a, as an initiative that will help us acquire more male customers uh, into our business and that too with the right type of product which is premium sports and sneakers so to answer your question i think one we will be able to serve our existing customers better they are in, most definitely interested in these products if you look at all the women around you they are wearing nike puma adidas and so forth on their feet uh, but it also allows us to attract the male consumer with a very compelling offering and you know through this we have some of the some assortment which no one else in the country has so we we'll hope to capitalize on both and also we have both uh, men on our nike fashion platform as well as we have a nike man as a platform which is also growing nicely okay so this could be a hook to get in more men into the platform yes also 
understood and just one uh, last final question uh, on the b2b business i saw that you have created a warehouse footprint which is uh, quite spread out but generally in this kind of a business uh, the the traditional thought process is to you know go by a cluster kind of a approach so, you know build scale in one cluster uh, through higher density and then scale up uh and any reason why you are taking this approach uh i think we wanted to build a national scale to be relevant to our brand partners and we are achieving that with this network and we may go to few more because i think uh intrastate is what is clearly necessary here uh, uh you know at least minimum and then also certain radius around the warehouses are all very critical to success um and these have been carefully chosen from that perspective and there will be more warehouses few more warehouses going forward like at least one per state but you have to also superimpose this on already existing warehouse network that we have for our uh you know for our e-commerce business which also by now is uh, in every state pretty much uh so for us it's not so i mean we are not a startup uh, company so we have a lot of investments already made which can plug and play into this to do this efficient perfect understood thank you so much uh, that's all my questions so thank like you. some brands we may uh, receive inventory in larger warehouse and then send it to the smaller warehouses so i think what works for nike is very different than from a total startup enter- company so thanks thank you the next question today comes from the line of kapil singh please go ahead your line is now open hi good evening this is kapil from namura um, most of my questions have been answered just uh, wanted to check what are the growth trends we are observing currently in uh, the key segment uh, is there any improvement that you are noticing or is they are fairly similar to what you saw in the last quarter so i think without sounding too optimistic i'd like to point out that the c global ceo of every beauty company has visited india over last 6 to 9 months so i think indian market has become a very promising beauty market for global companies where uh, you know from earlier ranking maybe in top 7 or 8 it is starting to rank in the top 5 markets sometimes top 3 from importance perspective so i think the 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 and also indian customer wants best of what the world has to offer because of social media so i think now the challenge lies in of course companies like nike have put in place very effective supply chains very effective network already in place like our store where store network is already 175 stores in 65 cities plus and we will take it to 100 cities that you know before you know it will be at uh more than 250 store network so i think we've created the networks that are it's possible for these global brands to leverage uh and that's why we keep harping on education but i think this the the trick lies in more and more education and i think you know nike land and we do a lot of beauty bars now we do a lot of in store uh, master classes for the customers and there is a big big emphasis on education so that we can grow the the category demand like if you look at certain like if you take a little bit of a far seat you know and you see the number of people who are trading stocks so if you see the number of people who are flying airlines you know domestic airlines these are all very large numbers and i think why can't beauty consumption be at that level it's not a very large ticket item it is a very small ticket item and it's a very it's a very affordable uh, item for most consumers and i think the indians have not been very enthusiastic about beauty and personal care consumption and i think the beauty and personal care industry is very underdeveloped in india compared to globally uh, like like i keep pointing out every time fashion also is five times the entire beauty and personal care market so we think that there is a work to be done and nike will continue to do that work and of course lot of beauty companies will beauty and personal care companies will also do the work like you are aware that hindustan lever has uh, now uh, uh, you know have a beauty specific focus rather than just the personal care so i think more uh, larger companies in the world are joining the bandwagon and uh, and uh, you know like l'oreal uh, luxury which was l'oreal lux which was not present in the country is entering with uh, already lancome and more brands like urban decay through us and the 
they came in through Serave. So we do see that big companies investing in India opportunity and uh, together all of us being able to grow the market to its rightful size and scale. Okay, uh, thank you. And on the fashion, I think what I would like to point out is that, you know, we are just a four-year business, which sometimes people forget. And uh, there's a lot of uh, assortment growth at this early stage. And with every passing year, we are bringing new assortment that makes the platform more complete and improves conversion and customer stickiness to the platform. And that same will continue over the next couple of years. Foot Locker is one such, you know, uh, effort in that direction, but there'll be more. And I think through that, uh, you know, through that process also, we feel very excited about what, what you know, what possible uh, future lies ahead. And I think marketing costs, if we can bring it under control, then that means we can afford, uh, you know, more investment in the business. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, and just one small follow-up on this uh, adjusted EBITDA margin that we have reported. Uh, could you tell us what was the adjusted EBITDA margin uh, like to like for Q2 of FY24 or Q3 of last year so that we can understand uh, what you're trying to convey here? No, just just to clarify, just to clarify, these are ESOP costs which have kicked in now. And so also as far as the GCC spends are concerned, they have kicked in now. Since it's coming for the first time, that's the reason we have highlighted. So while there have been past ESOPs, etc., there's been a grant which has uh, 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 come in now. And uh, uh, given 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 that this is sizable at around 7 odd crores and coupled with the GCC spend, which is about 3 and a half crores, it's a sizable amount. So that's the reason we have flagged it. Uh, so we will be reporting this adjusted EBITDA margin every quarter from now onwards, or this is you've just highlighted for this quarter? We've just highlighted for this quarter so that you could understand. I don't think we want to create too much of, you know, special reporting every quarter. Okay. Just thank the you. Okay. Thank you and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you. That was the last question we can take today. You may reach out to NICA's investor relations team for any additional queries. I'd now like to hand the conference over to the management team for closing remarks. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, team Morgan Stanley, for, as usual, uh, you know, doing a brilliant job and facilitating our excellent interactions. And I hope we've satisfied all the participants. And thank you very much for all the participants for being on the call and uh, pretty insightful uh, questions. And I hope we've been able to provide, uh, you know, answers to most of your questions. But otherwise, please reach out to us separately. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.